Frankenstein's monster. Every generation for the last 200 years can vividly picture the Frankenstein monster. Tall, imposing, usually mute. This beast is alive and not alive. Mobile, but haltingly so, that we, the more nimble among us, can escape his perilous embrace. Yet who is the real monster? The one who designed and constructed this being, or the one who was built? One wonders of such things when we see the sudden slaughters, bombings, and beheadings happening in many parts of the cities of Europe and the Middle East and beyond. We hear of ISIS and of Nigeria's Boko Haram. But guess where it all began? In the late 1970s, late 70s, an Afghan warlord, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, was hired by the Pakistanis as a gift to the U.S. CIA. Hakmatyar was a ruthless dude who hated both the U.S. and the Soviets. His Pakistani intelligence backers told him his job was to kill Russians, well, communists, actually, who wanted to restore the Najibullah regime. While the CIA was calling the guy a fascist and scary, then-President Ronald Reagan called them freedom fighters and invited some of them to the White House. Hekmet Yar, the head of something he called the Islamic Party, built a military machine he called the Mujahideen. That would be the seed of the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, now ISIS, and hundreds more across the world, trained, armed, and aimed at Western targets, and now aimed at the West itself. Mary Shelley Wollstonecraft, the author of the 1818 science fiction novel, Frankenstein, had the scientists say the following words. I beheld the wretch, the miserable monster whom I had created. Who was the real monster? The maker or the maid from imprisoned nation? This is Mumia Abu Jamal. These commentaries are recorded by Noel Hanrahan of Prison Radio. Oh, for sure, so busy. We got an excellent show here today, but first I want to say the views and opinions that of Comcast does not reflect his staff, his associates, or affiliates. With that being said, viewer discretion is advised, and the views of Black Sun does not reflect it. And in the arena, we are a council. Boy. Kevin was just talking about how we were talking about the Ukraine here. We're going to talk about Ukraine. And introduce the person to my right. Let's introduce yourself, Kevin. Sure thing. Uh, I'm Kevin Karen. Uh, been in Atlanta now for about three years. And again, yeah, we talked about this about a year ago. So uh, do some work with Georgia Peace and Justice Coalition, a couple other things around town. But that's it. Glad to be here. I be your brother and servant, Gidon, being Yashara all in the <laughs> arena. <laughs> And it's uncensored. How's everybody doing? It's your man, Vincent Cheeks, you know, actor, humanist, entertainer. You know what time it is. We're in for a great show today. Thank you for coming on, my man, Kevin. Uh, quick announcement. We are the Arena Uncensored now. We're still having some technical difficulties on YouTube. So if you want to find us on YouTube, still look us up under the Arena 2013, all one word, the Arena 2013, all one word. It will come up as the Arena Uncensored. Uh, so we're still working on that technical difficulty. Also, the phone lines are open. If you want to call in, give us a call, 770-559-2999. 770-559-2999. Let's get into the meat of this discussion, gentlemen. You want me to give some background? Let's get started, man. Absolutely. <clears throat> Okay, as you may or may not know, this week marked the one-year anniversary of the conflict between Russia and the Ukraine. Uh, it all started, I'll say it started with President, how do you say his name? Yan Yanukovych. Yanukovych at the time. President Yanukovych at the time, there was supposed to be a deal being made between Ukraine and uh, the European Union. Okay which is what the people of Ukraine wanted. Yanukovych, the majority of, the majority of okay. people of Ukraine wanted. At least right. in West Ukraine. Right, in Definitely. West Ukraine. Uh, Yanukovych, being the politician that he is, 
did a backdoor deal <laughs> and shunned the deal with the EU and was going to go into a deal with Russia. Russia. Until, that was the plan. He was going to sign a deal with Russia until the people of the Ukraine were like, no. Because Yanukovych is pro-Russian. Okay. And so the people, they're trying to pull, the majority of the Western Ukrainians are trying to pull away from Russia, and they want to form a, a closer union with the European Union. Uh, so that caused conflict. Uh, protesters got into this huge... Uh, I guess you can say battle with the police. There was at least 100 protesters killed at that time. Yanukovych fled. Uh, he went to a pro-Russian area of Ukraine, eventually went to Russia. Uh, so he has asylum in Russia. There was a new, once he fled, there was a new interim government uh, instituted, which, of course, Russia did not acknowledge. But the U.S. and the European Union, they did acknowledge um, once the interim government was in, they ended up going into an agreement with the EU where they would receive uh, basically $18 billion from the in International Monetary Fund, uh, but it was also contingent on them uh, reforming a lot of their, their judicial and their political system as well as their financial and economic policies, you know what I mean? So in order for those, them to get the money from the EU, they, there were certain uh, stipulations that they had to meet. Why not start a, like a two-state solution? I mean, apparently you have some people on the west side that feel a certain way, and then the people on the east side, because not only you said, you know, Yanukovych making backdoor deals, but the eastern <clears throat> Ukrainians were like, yeah, you know, we're Russian. Right, they're pro-Russian. Right. So it's the Crimea, uh, Crimea Peninsula. Okay, okay. Uh, so, Kevin, do you want to get into that question about why they don't want to do a, a, a two-state? Well, um, you know, I, I think when we go back to this, one of the issues is I actually think that we have a situation where we're going to see the breakup of Ukraine. Okay. Um, and I think that has been basically caught, going on for a while. There's always been, in the eastern side of Ukraine, borders Russia. That's you right. have places, strongholds like Donetsk, which is the second biggest city in Ukraine, <clears throat> right. to Kiev, the capital. Uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, which are right next to the Russian border. Mostly, I mean, people have ancestors in Russia. Uh, they remember, you know, they speak Russian primarily. Um, the, the wealth from the city, the economic uh, centers <laughs> in that part of the world are definitely more associated with Russia. So Eastern Ukraine has always been more pro-Russian. Western Ukraine, kind of a, the gateway into the West, uh, into, you know, Europe, right. um, has always done more business um, with the West, has always favored the policies of the West. And so I think, um, and, and to your point, uh, I think that this has been going on for a while. There's been, you know, it's been a divided country, country right. in, in its entire history. Right. Um, I would go back a little farther. So like you said, uh, you mentioned in... Uh, February 2013, that was when Yanukovych fled. Um, after, 2014. Uh, yeah, sorry, 2014. Right. After um, rejecting the deal with the European Union. Right. Um, I, I would like to make a note about that deal. Okay. And that note is that, uh, you know, at the time, the deal with the European Union said, um, if we, you know, bail you out because Ukraine was in trouble. Right. Every country's in trouble. Right. Everybody's <laughs> <laughs> in trouble. Uh, everywhere, everywhere. But um, Ukraine's in trouble. They need cash. And uh, EU said they would bail them out. The stipulation was they have to cut ties with Russia. I would say oh, that was the stipulation. Okay. I know that. Okay. Uh, they would have to cut ties with Russia. Now, Yanukovych being basically a shill of Vladimir Putin, right. a buddy with the Russian oligarchs and everything. Right. Um, and, and Ukraine has always been kind of a pseudo, I don't know, pseudo colony almost. The way that we treat a lot of Latin American countries right. or have in, in, throughout history. Right. Um, uh, so anyway, you have this situation where Yanukovych can't accept this deal because he can't accept departure with Russia. He, right. You know, that's cutting off his whole power relationship. Before you continue. Yeah. Didn't Yanukovych broker the initial deal with the European Union before he decided to do the backdoor deal? So my understanding is uh, that, you know, yes, he participated in negotiations around this deal. And he was particularly favorable 
to making a deal with Vladimir Putin, which he, which Vladimir Putin actually uh, offered. He said, "Why, why do you have to cut ties with Russia? Right. Um, why can't we have a tripartite agreement, a deal between Russia, Ukraine, and the EU, where we all figure this out, and we don't have to make Ukraine choose? Right. Because if we make Ukraine choose, it's going to break up. Half the population in the east He's, right. wants to stay with us. Half the population in the west wants to go uh, with with the U.S. and EU." And uh, so my point is that that was rejected in Washington, and it was rejected by the EU as well. So they, they never wanted – they really forced Ukraine to make this decision that Yanukovych did not want to make. He was in kind of a tough spot. He okay. needed money. He was willing to go to the EU and open up some avenues there. But okay. the EU and the West really said, you got to figure it out, either us or them. And I don't – I personally don't think that's the way to conduct – uh, policy. I'm not a big fan of U.S. foreign policy. I'm also not a big fan of Russian foreign policy. And uh, I think, you know, there are going to be negotiations. And I don't think you make a country like that that's right on Russian border make a decision who they have to choose. Who they have to. Absolutely. Especially with this question of NATO expansion, which I think we'll probably end up talking about. There might be another comment you wanted to... Sorry, the Russians don't want, you know... Um... <laughs> One thing, I, I, you know, and this goes back to even Georgia, they don't want no missiles being built on their border either. Right. You know, so they, 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 um, I can understand Vladimir Putin's concern. I, I wouldn't want, you know, no, that's too close. That's right at the back door. But don't you think the political oligarchy is brokering this divisive maneuver in order to maybe instigate uh, uh, what ultimately would become a, a military intervention. They would have to make a decision so that ultimately one or the other power would have supremacy and through that division they can begin to strategize and position themselves for who's going to take power and control. Well, if, if I can respond to that, first of all, this is already a huge military intervention. <laughs> uh, I mean, we don't see it in the news in the West. Uh, and, and I mean, you know, Europe and the United States the right. same, because this happens to be an issue that we agree on, and we all kind of report it the same way. Uh, it's different if you look at Russian news, right. um, and it's different if you look at some of the people in the U.S. who basically push back against this. But uh, if you look at Ukraine, if you look at the cities of Donetsk, if you look at what happened in Kiev, I mean, these cities are destroyed. These are cities that were... A year and a half, two years ago, you could go to, you could right. visit as a Westerner. Right. I mean, right. you know. Vacation in. Right, right. Um, and it's it's not the case Story. anymore. Mm -hmm. People's family members have died. People's family members, you know, Western Western Ukrainians have been killed by Eastern Ukrainians. Oh, absolutely. Eastern Ukrainians killed by Western Ukrainians. I personally, um, you know, at the beginning in Kiev, like you were mentioning, at the uh -huh. beginning, there were some really good people who went out in the streets and said, we want reform. We want, you know, closer ties to the West. Right. But we also want some more independence. Right. We don't want to be controlled anymore. Right. I don't think that has ever been the European Union and the U.S.'s intention <laughs> to, right. to say, hey, free Ukraine, let's uh, right. help you out. But um, I also don't think that's Russia's intention. So, exactly. I, you know, now we have a situation where what used to be just kind of ethnic hostilities, mm -hmm. pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainian, have turned into all-out war. Right. And... Uh, in Donetsk, you have pro-Russian supporters really mistreating uh, Ukrainian sympathizers and pro-Ukrainian people. Right. You got the same thing going on in Kiev, though. I mean, you have in Kiev, you have uh, uh, pro-Ukrainian, pro-Western forces, and even some Ukrainian nationalists who right. ascribe to Nazism and mm. stuff that so, are kind of stirring things up. Yeah. It's so it's almost like there's a internal civil war going on absolutely. at the same time that this issue is going on with I would Russia. absolutely say that that's the case. There's a civil war. Russia's backing the East. The, the rebels. U.S. Yeah. is backing the West. Now we're talking about giving weapons. We, we said we weren't going to do it. Now we're talking about giving weapons to Ukraine. But isn't that the way they've always done it? They've sit back, instigated internal strife right. while they wait and see Who's going to win? And then they ultimately take off. Now, I want to ask you this question because I, I like to bring it back to our own people in our struggle. And, mm -hmm. and as an uh, intellectual observer, what would you say would be the parallels between Ukrainian people and their, this intervention by these two superpowers 
and quote unquote black people in America and our fight for independence. Are you asking me, or do you want to comment? Go ahead. I well, let me comment on that. Sure. Uh, I, I can try to parallel real, real, real nicely, but what I want to first say is, uh, you know, they're putting a lot of pressure on Russia. Cause I, I know we, me and Vince, we talked about they were doing some type of sanctions. Yeah. Yeah, they've uh, put sanctions on Russia, uh, J Canada, uh, the EU, the U.S., put sanctions on Russian officials and politicians saying they can't travel, you know, to, to uh, the respective countries. Okay, but why put that, I mean, what, what, what is the goal behind that putting sanctions on Russia? I mean, they don't want them giving them weapons? They want, like they don't Russia, like Russia. They, well, well, <laughs> of course, there's already a, a hostile relationship between Thank the you. United States and Russia. Yeah. Um, but well, I mean, but okay, there's always been a hostile since the McCarthy era, but there were right. never any sanctions. So what right. Are specific? Well, the U.S. and the EU want Russia to leave Ukraine alone, right. and they want them out of Ukraine. Now, in the beginning, you know, Russia was sending forces over there and, and people, but they said as of late that they have that Russia has withdrawn, and it's just the the pro-Russian separatists. Mm -hmm. That have been doing all the fighting, which the EU and US does not believe. They still believe that uh, Russia is sending divided. troops over there. But Russia's statement is anybody that's doing any fighting and killing over there in Ukraine are just volunteers. Okay, <laughs> that <laughs> that, that is Putin's stance. Oh, I can't help if people want to go over there and help the pro-Russian separatists, you know, get away from the Ukraine. Um. And so, and I think their cause is legitimate. You think whose cause is legitimate? The, the separatists, the pro-Russian separatists. Because, like I said, you know, him making that deal, he was representing, based on reports I've heard, is that the Eastern Ukrainians wanted to side with Russia. They didn't want. To, they didn't want to mess with the, the UN. They saying because the UN has a bad reputation. Of the EU, you mean? The, the EU. EU. I'm sorry. Yeah. The EU has a bad reputation of because they mess with the IMF about getting loans right. and the countries that get the loans right. always get the short end of the stick. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anybody getting the loan gets the short end of the stick. That's how they do it. But Black, I want to ask, and I asked the question and I ask it to him, but obviously it just affects us more. When we talk about these powers and our people being dominated by these global uh, colonists, Right. And, you know, we we want independence, but at least they know where their homeland is. They know their own language. They're in their country. Right. But but agreeing on that you have I'm saying how does that relate to us? That's Gideon, mm -hmm. we're going to relate it at the end of the show. <laughs> See, Gideon's always about it. It's about us. Me. Let's not do the me, me, me. <laughs> oh, I'm okay. glad. Please, let's not do this today. Right. Go ahead. You have the opportunity on, on Yanga's show. He does the nas national. Okay. The national, okay? That's right. I'm tying it all together because we're all homo sapiens at the end of the day, right? Oh, right. But you don't deal with science. That's, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's all right. That's all right. What I'm saying is that you have Ukrainians that feel two different ways. One that wants to go with Russia and one that wants to go with the EU. The EU. The EU. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm saying is that I mean, Kevin said, and I said, at the end of the day, I think there's going to be a split. Well, this is my thing. If if Western Ukraine wants to do the Western world thing, mm -hmm. okay, and they're the majority, right? The rest of Ukraine is the majority. Well, okay. So I think because that's up for debate. Know, I, think they, yeah. I, th I mean, we've had, like, some elections, right, in, right. in Ukraine. Uh People said, I mean, Yanukovych, who was the previous pro-Russian president right. elected, right? Right. He was elected. It was an election. Yes. Was it corrupt? Yeah. Are our elections <laughs> corrupt? Yeah. Yes. I mean, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he was elected. And sure, there was a lot of pro-Russian support for him. Now, in, in uh, February, uh, I, I want to note, in February of uh, last year, 2014, there was a, a chance for peace. Vladimir Putin and Obama got on the phone and they said, "Okay, um, we're gonna we're gonna support Yanukovych's decision, which he made a decision to step down early." 
and say, let's have another election in September. Let's move elections up. So he was going to give, you know, six to eight months for people to organize, have an election. Yanukovych, I'm sure he believed he would win that election. Right. I'm sure he believed he could pull all the same tricks. But he said we could have an election. Right. President Obama agreed to that. And this was, like you were saying, this is one year ago this week. Right. Um, What happened was they got on the phone. They said, great. That night, that night in Kiev, Yanukovych is in the capital. That night, Ukrainian, pro-Ukrainian people, pro-West people stormed Stormed the capital. And Yanukovych fled. And why did he flee? Why did he flee? Well, he could have done two things. He could have uh, stayed and risked getting killed. killed. Right. <laughs> he could have tried to call in the military for support and say, hey, protect, protect me. me. <laughs> However, at that point, the military officials had already lined up. There's pro-Russian military officials right. and there's pro-Western right. military right. officials. They already lined up. Yanukovych had no power. Mm. That's why he left Ukraine. He couldn't control the country. Mm. He had his power dissolved because these militaries are being trained and supported by either the West or the East. Right. Well, here's my thing. If there's this separation between Western Ukraine and Eastern mm-hmm. Ukraine, and Ukraine, the Ukraine is an autonomous state, right? Don't they have a certain degree of autonomy? Yeah. Yeah. If the Eastern... They should. <laughs> right, they're supposed to. <laughs> right. But if the pro-Russian separatists want to be pro-Russian that bad, yeah. then why don't they just get up and leave? They're right there on the border. Why don't they get up and leave and go to Russia? Okay, I mean, okay. how hard would that be? Well, you know, you can watch. Um, so I think Vice has done some decent reporting on this because okay. what they do is they go in and they just shoot and show you what's going on. And in Donetsk, a pro-Russian capital, okay. you have pro-Russian people shouting at at pro uh, West people, at people who want to support a national Ukraine, right. and saying, if you want to be in Ukraine so bad, go back to Kiev. And they're shouting back, if you want to be Russian so bad, go over to Russia. Oh, yes. The right. fact is, this territory, it used to be part of Russia. There you go. Kiev used to be capital or a central, at least, city That's right. uh, to the Soviet Union. Right. And so there are people who feel deeply that where they are born, whether it's in Donetsk or you know just across the border in right. Russia or over in Kiev, that this is part of who, who they, they are. are. Who they are, right? And and so then it all comes back to where your ancestry is from. Are you? I mean, and and that's a question that I'm sure you guys have thought about a little bit, being that you are black people in the United States, and there's some questions around what it means to be a nation. Within right. a nation. Well, right. it's hard to be able to talk about that when we get black. <laughs> so we'll, we'll forego that as his show. But no, the, no, uh, go ahead, say what you're saying. Well, the point has to do with when we look at these examples of anarchy in a system of oppression, we have to use the world scene as a theater where we can begin to galvanize our own resources to protect ourselves. That's why I looked at this particular situation and you've got this Russian, and you said that uh, America America has placed sanctions on Russia before monetarily. Not to this extent. This is the the, the deepest sanctions that uh, Russia has ever had imposed on them. Ah, well, we know that the Cold War never stopped, really, with America and Russia. Right. So even though the wall came tumbling down, the uh, rhetoric was still going on. But when we look yeah, at this particular Cold War, but we got people going back and forth from Russia to America all the time. I, I mean, I would also argue that in a way, the Cold War, as it was, did come to an end, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and now it's 60s, escalated right? again. Now mm-hmm. it's escalated again. Well, I would say in the in the eighties and mm-hmm. early nineties, mm-hmm. okay, uh, when in when the U.S. Um, when the USSR, the Soviet Union, mm-hmm. collapsed, mm-hmm. or people say it collapsed, people say it, it broke up, whatever. Right. When it broke up and ended in 1990, Gorbachev was in charge, and there was a deal made with it was Senior Bush Senior at the time. Mm-hmm. James Baker was his Secretary of State, and mm-hmm. he said, "Fine, here's the deal. Soviet Union has collapsed. That means that Germany, which was being competed over mm-hmm. at the time in Berlin." You had East and West, and the wall came down. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. The deal was we are going to reunify Germany, and Germany has become part of NATO, part of the U.S. military alliance. And James Baker said, and I quote at this meeting, NATO expansion will not continue one inch to the east. Now, that was not... That, that was said at the meeting. Right. I mean, it's officially said. Everybody knows it was said. Right. But then, you know, 
through the 90s, you have Clinton who began uh, began expansion. Right. And, I mean, we're talking east, right? Mm -hmm. NATO expansion continues east, mm -hmm. and uh, that was led by the under secretary the the under secretary of uh, of state at the time. His mm -hmm. name is Strobe Talbot. Mm -hmm. This guy is also the head of the Brookings Institute. The Brookings Institute is one of the main think tanks that influences Washington. Mm -hmm. He wants us to go into war with Russia. This guy was involved in the Clinton administration mm -hmm. and basically said, you know, let's break that promise. Let's mm -hmm. continue. I mean, if we want to continue military or er, expansion of American power, we need to continue expanding NATO. And uh, we can do that because it wasn't written. Those Russians were stupid enough not to write it in. Are you saying the U.S. The... broke a promise? I'm saying <laughs> no, they broke No, no, no. no. <laughs> See, I'm old enough to remember uh, Gorbachev. I'm taking up a lot of space. <laughs> Glasnos, Perestroika. Sure. This was terms that were referencing openness and trying to bring in Western ideals. But see, this is the one thing that everybody forgot. They still had the military, the bombs, everything. The the nuclear arsenal mm -hmm. was never diminished. Right. They claimed that they were going to destroy a certain portion. Of, they claimed that they were going to diminish a certain portion of their arsenal. Right. But at the end of the day, nobody went back and checked to see if those missiles that had been pointing at America for as many years as they've been enemies were removed. What's political posture? Nobody's not going to stay. Yeah, that's too much reliance. That's too religious, Gideon. To rely on too much on the goodwill of men. That, that's not reality. Okay? Russia's not going to goddamn diminish their nuclear arms, and the U.S. is not going to diminish their arms. That is both sides. That's their ace in the hole. But they said well, they were. Okay, and? <laughs> well, but, even but, to now, currently, Russia feels like it didn't start the, this war with the Ukraine. Right. They feel like it was in response to Western aggression because mm -hmm. they feel like mm -hmm. the United States organized and funded the coup to overthrow uh, Yanukovych. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> well, that's what Russia says. And then we say in the West, we say it was a revolution. So that right. There I you mean, go. I mean, exactly. it depends on what propaganda you, you, you want to listen to. Exactly. Uh, but, you know, after Yanukovych was ousted or left or however you want to put it, and this is what I didn't know. This wasn't part of the narrative the first time we did the story. Okay. Russia is saying that the U.S. Special Services orchestrated the Maiden uh, Revolt, which is what started this back in last February, okay. uh, when Ukraine citizens uh, overthrew Yanukovych. So they're saying that the U.S. Special Services started all of this chaos in order to move NATO closer to the Russian borders. And so once Mr. Yanukovych was gone, the U.S. offered Ukraine's interim government $25 billion hmm. so that they could place missile defenses oh, on right. the Russian border. I had no idea uh, that happened. And so Russia feels like they did that in order to shift the balance of nuclear power towards America and so Russia feels like they had no choice but to act because they were responding to this potential aggression, <laughs> aggression from the United States and this right. you know, yeah. plot that they think the United States helped orchestrate, which... It's eh, called military eh. posturing, sir. Right. right. <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, I just thought that was pretty interesting to, to me because when we first did the story last year, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that it's strictly some Ukrainian and Russian right. issues. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I thought America was stepping in because they right. didn't want Russia mm -hmm. to regain control of this territory. Uh, Russia you know, don't want it. They, they, they don't want you the whole Ukraine. They just want I, Russia. Uh, because uh, they still, okay, I'm just uh, you. the prime minister, okay. he just said this Saturday, the prime minister of Ukraine. Ukraine. Mm -hmm. He, he basically Arseny Yatsenyuk. Yatsenyuk. He basically said that the ceasefire is non-existent. Right. right. It's been non-existent since it was implemented February exactly. 12th. He said Putin has a greater plan, which Putin, he, he said out of his own mouth. 
But he said out of his own mouth that Putin wants to take over the entire Ukraine. Well, right. and that's what we should right. expect from Arseny Yatsenyuk, who Victoria Nuland, the State Department spokesman at the time, who okay. is now the uh, kind of representative for Eurasia, um, she, she said in a call, you know, who do we want to put in power? We want Arseny Yatsenyuk, who is a moderate Western supporter, believe, and, and uh, she... We wanted him in power, and the fact was that soon after Yanukovych left, there was a meeting in Kiev the day after, right? right? This is a year ago this week, right. and the meeting had the right sector, which is this really right-wing pro-Ukrainian nationalist thing, mm -hmm. um, and you have the Western supporters, and they all got together, and they decided to put Poroshenko, who's this... The current president. The, a very rich Western businessman. Right. Capitalist. Sells, yeah. Right. He sells chocolate. That's what he's famous for. <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, they put him as the president, and Arseniy Yatsenyuk became the prime minister. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think we can expect, you know, him to say things demonizing Putin. Right. Um, at the same time, I think there are plenty of reasons that we should demonize Putin. I mean, Ukraine has been under the thumb of Russia for a long, long time. So I'm, I'm not arguing... You know, that there's a good side here, but I, uh, I, I don't think anybody's fighting for, you know, the poor and oppressed right. of Ukraine at exactly. this point. I think in exactly. the East you have oligarchs and kind of really uh, aggressive uh, people that are supporting Russia. Right. And you have the same thing situation in the uh, West. And so I think um, what we need to consider is how do we get Russia to back down? And I think the way to do that is to say Ukraine will not become part of NATO. And, uh, you know, let's call for a ceasefire, a real ceasefire on both sides. And I think that means Kiev needs to take back their artillery. They need to co stop calling people in the East terrorists. Because <laughs> what they do in Kiev, they call the Easterners, they call them terrorists. Right. And the Eastern Ukraini Ukrainians call that the Westerners um, fascists. I mean, that's the, that's the United States teaching right there. That's right. You got to call your enemy the terrorist it, so, you know, you can get sympathized. It makes me think about the Hutus and the Tutsis. And oh, how that and Haiti. They get, mm. Yes, yeah. and how they were able to demonize one another. And that's and what see, they're doing. They're demonizing right. one another. And right. see, when you look at this philosophy, and, and you've got militarized ideology from the West and from Russia. Right. Yeah. What you mentioned was, I think, the key point. What's happening to the poor? Yeah. Because, see, the poor people are caught up in a quandary and in betwixt two demonic powers. that for, And that's, that's why I had to reflect that upon us as a people <laughs> in America. See, but that, and that's why I said both sides. I mean, I think the people are legitimate on both sides. You know what I'm saying? I think the, the, the Eastern Europeans, they see the benefits of being with Russia. And the other side see the benefits. Because they, they've had town meetings. They had fist fights. <laughs> so, I mean, they had, like, so are we uh, are we beyond the point of democratic solutions or non-violent solutions? Let me say. I agree with Kevin. I think they should split up because both sides are gonna they're gonna stand their ground. You know, hmm. both sides. I mean, I think I think Russia should take the eastern half because their ships are there. Right. So that, Putin's not gonna no. He, yeah, that's why no. they took Crimea back because it's right. a major military hub. Yeah. So, right. so they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna fight to the death to keep that. And I don't think fighting the devil with Russia is a good idea right about now. But no Ukraine weapons. feels like Crimea is theirs. Okay. Eastern European? I mean, Eastern... Uh, the Western Ukraine. The Western Ukraine. Yeah, the, the, the Western part. That's well, what I said. They, they should do a sport. Well, they, well, want, they, they military, want to fight over this. They want that military hub, too. I agree. You know, they don't want to... You know, because Russia has a, a, a lease, a contract, I believe, through 20... 40, maybe somewhere around there, okay. where they're supposed to be able to house their military fleets there. And now, since, you know, there's this conflict, even before the whole conflict, Ukraine really didn't want them, their military uh, fleet there anymore. And so that's why the, the Crimea is this major, uh, I guess, hub, if you will, that mm -hmm. they're fighting over mm -hmm. because it's not only is it, a military hub, but it's a major, it's a major port. Port, you know, yeah. imports and exports. They see, this is why I think they should take a, a note from the Palestinian booklet of self-defense, oh, oh, because what are the Palestinians doing? They're fighting with rocks. That's what Ukrainians are doing. That, that's They're doing exactly. the same thing. They're no, taking the page because that's that, why they were asking for for uh, military assistance from us because no. they 
fighting with rocks and bottles. And but at the end of the day, they're fighting against two. It's like when uh, people in this country say, well, I voted for the lesser of two evils. But guess what? You still, still voted evil. for evil. <laughs> still evil. So That's you need to fight. That's their choice, though. Well, my point is, it isn't their choice. Isn't From what choice. I hear you saying is you have these two imperialist powers right. vying for land, port, import, right. export right. Uh, features right. the for, um, are from are the... For which government influence they want over that because that influence will change their lives. So if, if it's exactly. Russia... They will be a certain way of life. It's the, if it's the uh, EU, it's going to be a certain way of life. But my, my point and is so that sometimes change. you have to deal with your own perspective because whether it's Russia or the West, they're still both capitalists. At the end of the day, they're Idiot. industrialists, so they Idiot. are both going to control that. that. You had the opportunity to leave the country, and you came right back into that capitalist country, and you continue to pay Taxes there or whatever, you're here in this country. So I don't want to hear that. You are Gideon. You had the opportunity to go to Nigeria, didn't you? Well, I did go to and Nigeria. And you came right back. Well, I have a you mother right here. I have God. mother and, right and responsibilities you. here. You want to take your mother and but, go to yeah. Israel or get somewhere out of America. If you don't love this goddamn country. <laughs> <laughs> well, they claim your president don't love this country. But what I'm saying is that the poor have to fight for themselves. Because at the end of the day, no matter which side you look at, they are up for themselves. So the poor have to fight for themselves. That's the only point that I'm making. What would you say about that? Well, um, so... I think that uh, I, I think that in this situation you have a lot of poor people who are really like the people who are doing the fighting. Why are they fighting? I mean, some of them are you know from they're, they're Ukrainian people doing right. the fighting right now. Right. And uh, yeah, there's Western people there. There's Russian troops there in right. some places. Right. Um, but I would say that the the people doing the fighting, the ones that are Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. The reason they're fighting is because they know if the Russians win, they're going to get made generals. They're going to get made, you know, legislatures. Mm -hmm. the, right. You know, all they're going to get. They're going to get brought into the fold. Oh, they're right. going to get brought into the fold. Right. They're going to get money. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So right. they're fighting. I mean, these are people who are already have some some extent of power. Right. And they're fighting to keep their own power. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I mean, when you speak of oppressed people right. fighting. Um, I am of the belief that uh, people who are who are being oppressed mm -hmm. um, should be able to fight for their own freedom, absolutely, and should have the right to fight their oppressor. Thank I, you. I believe that, yes. and so uh, yes, I think that there are times, actually, even in this country, yes. where to fight back is to is to some extent um, a deterrent to more violence and more oppression. Thank you. N let me give you a perfect example of that. <laughs> yeah, he's so like that. He took the like European. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> let me give you a perfect example of that, and it's Afghanistan. Okay. Afghanistan, those poor people on horseback, mules, the West, Russians, all of them have been run out of Afghanistan. <laughs> They don't have any technology. They don't have any of the uh, modern uh, things. That, but they, they have, have the weapons that America and Russia supplies them, Gideon. Their AK-47s are either made in China, Russia, or America. They don't have AK-47 manufacturing plants in Afghanistan. Have, er, have Russia and the United States been run out of Afghanistan? Been, answer my question. Russia, <laughs> Russia, have, answer <laughs> my question. Yes, they have. Okay, then. Point no, made. Who weapons? Doesn't matter. Were, it does matter. They were ran out of Af the Russians were ran out of Afghanistan with American weapons. <laughs> but they still are standing their ground. This They're is the standing point. Standing their ground because right. they have the technology. Gideon. So you made an incorrect statement. I'm about to do the matrix on you. <laughs> they do have some technology. I will, yeah, I will agree with Black. They do have some technology. So I, I actually am curious um, what you think, Vincent, as far as like what's going to happen with the country and maybe what chances there are for peace at this point or, or at least resolving the conflict. Well, first of all, if both sides... <laughs> because I don't know. <laughs> if, if, if both sides could adhere to a, a, a ceasefire for more than 25 hours... 
24 hours, maybe they would be able to go into some some uh, diplomatic talks, if you will, but they can't put down the guns long enough <laughs> to establish, you know, any type of agreement. Right. So um, what, but, what are reasonable agreements, though? That's what I'm curious. Right, like, what yeah. would be reasonable? Um, well, because that's what I'm constantly thinking. Of. Well, with that. <laughs> it's I was going to what say, the you gotta go, you gotta go ask, Well, first you got to ask the people. Right. What are well, their objectives? Should, I'm sorry. You <laughs> should, right. That's what I'm going to say. You should be asking the people what they want, but the people right. are split. So, therefore, you have to go in at the governmental uh, entity and try to decide what's best for the people. Peace is what's best. Peace is, mm-hmm. peace is what's best, but peace is not. For me, from my research, is not on the is not on the immediate forefront. Peace right. is not on the immediate forefront. Right. Right. I go back to what you said, mm-hmm. uh, comparing the Palestinian and the Israelis. Right. We already know the Palestinians said they're gonna fight with sticks, rocks, and bottles in, until there are no more Palestinians. Right. Right. One of the ar- uh, articles I read uh, recently, uh, one of the Ukrainian officials, I can't remember who it was, he basically said the same thing. Right. He said, Ukraine is, Western Ukrainian mm-hmm, official, right. mm-hmm. Ukraine is ours. It's been ours for X amount of time. Right. Mm-hmm. We're not going anywhere. So even though we can't match up with the Russian Technology. military power, And they really can't. Right. right. We're going to fight, fight because Ukraine is our land. Right. We're not going anywhere. Yes. And so for me, if, if you have uh, an official making statements like that right uh the the prospects for peace are slim to none really if you ask me um even with the ceasefire to uh that was implemented on february 12th and you had four leaders uh from around the world you had uh vladimir putin russian (laughs) president you had petro poroshenko the ukrainian president you had the french president Francois Holland, and you had the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, all came up with the terms of this ceasefire Mm -hmm. that Putin and Poroshenko signed on February 12th. Within 24 hours, Russia saying they violated. Ukraine saying they violated. And we won't know what happened. We we never know. So if there's no trust, Mm -hmm. if there's no trust on either side, Mm -hmm. The prospects of peace look very bleak. Right. You know what I mean? So, so can we do this? Um, can't, we can't pinpoint the violations. I think a lot of the issues to be resolved. I mean, well, they, they, they haven't pinpointed. <laughs> I mean, because Ukraine is saying Russia right. has, has, has violated multiple times. Russia is saying Ukraine has violated multiple well, times. Right. And again, it comes down to there's a line in the sand. Okay. Which line are you on? And, and who do you this, believe? This will feed Gideon's about how to get to all people like black and black. Okay. <laughs> but calmly. You have people. You know, you have COINTELPRO. Certainly. That stirred up a lot of mess between, like, let's say, the black nationalists. Absolutely. So Absolutely. I'm thinking that you have agents Mm-hmm. Whether it be American or provocateurs, provocateurs, yeah, mm-hmm. provoking, right? Yes. For whatever. Well, reason. well hold, on, hold on. Go before ahead. you jump in, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna give two quotes, and this along with what you said about mm-hmm. the prospects of peace and this, that, and the other. I'm gonna give two quotes, and these quotes are gonna illustrate, for me anyway, why peace is pretty far off in the distance. Okay. Mm-hmm. First quote. From somebody you all may be familiar with, Secretary of State John Kerry. Uh oh. Warmonger. <laughs> <laughs> he accuses Moscow of craven or cowardly behavior mm-hmm. in its support for the rebels. And he accuses Russia of undermining the ceasefire. Mm-hmm. And he says, We're not going to sit there and be a part of this kind of extraordinarily craven behavior at the expense of the sovereignty and integrity of a nation. If this failure continues, make no mistakes. There will be further consequences that will place added strains on Russia's already troubled economy. Mm -hmm. Now, he's talking about sanctions, more sanctions specifically, Mm -hmm. because him and Obama are in talks about what more added sanctions in the EU, what more added sanctions they can put on Mm -hmm. Russia to get them to leave Ukraine alone. Mm -hmm. But this type of rhetoric is inflammatory. It's inflammatory. And then, on the other side of the coin... You have Pooty, what I like to call him. 
It is. <laughs> President Vladimir Putin, or Putin, he says, Putin, the reflection of the, <laughs> the views and opinions of. <laughs> I'm going to use that. <laughs> President Putin says that America wants to freeze the order established after the Soviet collapse and remain an absolute leader, thinking it can do whatever it likes, while others can only do what is in that leader's interest. Right. Maybe some want to live in a semi-occupied state, mm. but we do not. Mm. That's inflammatory rhetoric. Yeah. And Putin has already said if America wants to come with that nuclear weapon talk, oh, we got nukes too. Got and it. it will be a boomerang effect. Yes. Mm -hmm. So with talk like that coming from, and again, mm -hmm. you got Russia and America on both sides, and right. Ukraine is in the middle. Yeah, like, exactly. so we're just Gonna seeking a little crushed. bit more autonomy. We right. just want to have a little bit more independence and do right. our own thing. We're tired of Russia stepping on us. We're tired of right. you know, U.S. trying to tell us what to do and manipulate things. You know what? And I think mm -hmm. all the people that feel that way mm -hmm. are now hiding in their homes because if they were to go out in the streets and say something like that, then yeah, they're they going to be attacked by yeah. either pro-Russian forces or pro or right. or pro-Western. Right. Okay, so even with so, a statement like that, what, yeah, yeah, the, the prospects for peace are not they're diminished. Very, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, but it's see, this is bleak. the other side because see, that's one thing about having a homeland, not fighting for rhetoric, not fighting for resources, but fighting for honor and your ancestors. Case in point, right. Haiti, mm -hmm. which you know is Haiti. Right. Mm -hmm. Haiti is a small island. The European power of France saw that as a port where they could use to create domination and help to expand their military resources. Right. Those Haitian people through the help, the power of God, black, <laughs> you understand that, homie? <laughs> they use military strategy, and even though they had their technology, right. they had more numbers, they had everything, but they didn't have the resolve and understanding of topography, military strategy, and spiritual enrichment that they were able to defend, defeat, and defy an opposing force. That's what I'm saying. The people in the Ukraine, they have that same strategy, ability, and resolve. You can fight against a greater, larger, more technologically advanced power. Okay, now me, to you, me, sir. Let me, answer your, let me make a reply to your statement in two folds. First of all, I'm going to go back in the past, which... A lot of the people seem to be stuck on, mm -hmm. but you're, uh, after, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Aristide? No, no, not Aristide. The one, the main guy, he got caught by the French government. You know, Desline took over, was an atheist. So they asked Desiline, him a question. Okay. Desiline, yeah, he didn't even know You're guy. talking about Troussant Louverture. You know, when Troussant Louverture got caught. Desiline took over, and he wasn't with none of that stuff. He mm -hmm. wasn't with that voodoo stuff. He was like, you know, <laughs> put it on the table. That's the type of person he was. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, you talk about the Haitian people. Let's talk about today. You have so many political organizations that couldn't get it together, even when before the great, uh, let's just say, earthquake or where heart machine, whatever Thank you, call you. It, right, whatever technology. The heart machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. People that could not come together politically. You know what I'm saying? Even when Aristide was kidnapped and mm -hmm. taken to the Congo, you even had all these different factions then. So it's the same with Ukraine. Now, what I'm saying, and this is going to relate to they all... They have agent provocateurs. Not there. even agent provocateurs. You have... We, I mean, hell, we... we you're saying a people with a nation, but even within that nation, you have groups that don't necessarily agree. True, true. On the politics. At, you know, so you have to come to the table, like, you know, say, Kevin was saying, you got people, they, they, they fear out of coming there, out of their house because of Ukrainian pro-Russia, and you got a fascist Western, you know, and it's funny because of... The EU, those are the sides that the Nazis are on. Am I not mistaken? Because well, you know, Russia, Russia was again. If it, if it, let me just say this for the record, since you want to do some history. Put it on the it record. Was it for? Oh, man. I'm sorry. Brain, brain freeze. Brain freeze. <laughs> it for Stalin. Mm -hmm. We all speak, be speaking German right now. I hear that. You know why? Because Hitler was so damn stupid, he sent his. 
Russian troops, I mean, German, German troops, troops into yeah. the Russian front. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Stalin was like, okay, bring him, bring him. Okay, just about uh, two more minutes. Oh, cold front and wipe them out. It's the winner. Mm-hmm. Nazi pops. Who it's controls snow. the winner? <laughs> and let many of his own population die. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that was right. for a greater good. Yeah. Right, right. Mother <laughs> Russia. <laughs> so, so the point I'm making is yes. that, the point I'm making is that you have people in these nations that don't agree, okay? There's division. There's division, right. So you have to go back. To, it goes back to the people again. And I think that a solution that John Kerry or... But we're Kerry on the same Kerry, page now. I agree with no, you. No, no, I agree no. with that. So, all right, I'm the poor. I'm saying, well, I'm, I'm saying it's going to have to boil down to a two-state solution. It's going to have to boil down to that. Give the Russian, the pro-Russian people, the eastern side. Give the pro-Russian people the western side. And if you agree with the, if you agree with this side, go to this side of the border. Go to that side of the border. Still Ukraine, eastern western Ukraine. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. You know, I, I mean, okay. what I would like to see is maybe something similar. Um, I would like to see a firm commitment from President right. Obama and the entire administration that Ukraine will not become part of NATO. I think okay. that that would ease some tension. I think that that would start a conversation. Now, what's the likelihood of that? Well, I think... <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I agree. I'm just saying, what's the likelihood? Because well, you know, know, what, the, what the U.S. <laughs> wants, the U.S. gets. Yes. <laughs> You're talking about two imperialists <laughs> dominating <laughs> military, you know, just, they are just, when have they ever kept any of their treaties? We got, oh, but, well. but see, because we don't, we don't vote. Because we don't vote. We don't vote. Oh, come on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, man. Sorry. Got alter ego over here, man. Hold on, hold on, listen, listen. You're thinking like a child listen, over there, listen, man. Y'all know why Benjamin Netanyahu came over here? Because the BB, Jewish constituency wanted him on both sides. I'm because he up. pulling back those deals like Yanukovych did. That's why he came over him. Yeah, but <laughs> it's turning on your boy who said he invited him because John uh, Boehner Boner, Boner was saying one thing, <laughs> but we know, got that in now. <laughs> but this is the point. Now the Israelis are saying they did not send Net, well, Netanyahu doesn't represent their perspective. Right. They're right. saying, right. Yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. they're yeah. saying this. Right. What Boner did was he did that on his own. Not only that, he, he went to France on his own when they were doing the Charlie Hebdo. Uh, right. Exactly. Right. So, again, that's that's exactly. But however, we're point, talking about political oh, corruption however, now. However, no, no, no. You yes. Say that. However, the, the, the pro right Israeli Zionists backed them 100%. Just forget that. That's uh-huh. right. Well, this so, illustrates so, the point you make about the division within the various okay. groups. That uh, uh, no, one side is saying right. they support the other side, but then right. you have a leader who's operating on his own agenda. Not necessarily. Oh man, on the come right on. Side, the right side backed them. They said, "Yeah, we we for you going to France and going to America. We back you, Putin." But that's not the vast majority. They claim to be a democratic it's, it's still, democratic society. That's my point. See, all of it is corrupt. And that's why the poor have to establish themselves because whether it's the Russian, uh, uh, the Russian or the Western, I don't know if you get East or the West, you still have the same ideology of domination and control. So if the poor don't recognize that, and I think that's a unifying rallying point that they will that that will bring them together, mm-hmm. a unifying rallying point because you got the West. Who well, are I mean, dominating, no, and you got the East that have the same philosophy and agenda. Maybe for the people that Kevin mentioned hiding in their homes, but for the pro Russian side, for the Russian side now, no, I, 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 I'm missing that. That's one of my. Well, I mean, obviously, you have those who are capitalists, and they are just looking at who's going to the resources and how they're going to be able to tap into those resources. Yeah. Then you have those nationalists, okay. like you supposed to be. That are concerned <laughs> about the nation in which their ancestors came from and how they're going to protect their own heritage, lineage, and identity. Can I respond to that? Go ahead, please. Um, you know, I think uh, I think nationalism can be a good thing, mm-hmm. and I also think that there are problems with nationalism sure. at times, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so. Um, I would say that a lot of people who brand themselves, in Ukraine specifically, as Ukrainian nationalists, 
are a lot of the same people who are kind of affiliated with this very right wing. Um, this uh, and even some neo-Nazi sentiment. Um, so I would not necessarily I would I would caution people to jump and say we should support people who are nationalists just because they're nationalists. Now nationalism, uh, like you know, if you're if you're referencing things like black nationalism in the United States, I think that there are some very good things that have come out of that and right. some really great movements. Mm-hmm. But I would not equate those. I mean, right. I think exactly. I think we need to, and this is the way that I kind of choose uh, how supportive I am of certain regimes or whatever. I right. think that you choose based on how they treat the poorest and most oppressed among them. Absolutely. Um, you know, if you look at the way homeless people or you know, people who suffer all kinds of uh, social of ills, social and economic ills, absolutely, um, are treated in Ukraine. They are not being prioritized by any side right now. There's a war in Ukraine, and the focus is just on winning this war, right. and, <laughs> and it's really about it, forget it, the people. Yeah, and I do think it's a proxy war. I mean, Obama has gotten on TV and said this is not a proxy war. This is not a new Cold War. Right. But I think that's that's completely it's rhetoric. False. I think it's completely twisting the situation right. because he's trying to turn around the truth. Um, and I mean, well, Gregor, I, you don't speak American politics. Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid it's not a proxy war. You're having a proxy war. Right. 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 You know. Let me let me put this question out there. Do they teach that in college? <laughs> I'm gonna put this uh, for Kevin, but anybody can jump in, sure. and it goes back to the question about peace uh, that you mentioned earlier. We know that Canada, U.S., EU, Japan, all these nations are putting sanctions on Russia. Due to these sanctions, the Russian economy is kind of collapsing. You know what I mean? The Russian yeah. ruble. You know, it went down on the exchange rate. They're saying that Russia may be facing a, a liquidity crisis and even a recession due to all these sanctions and, you know, stuff happening with Russia. So with that being said, do you feel like the U.S. and these other Western powers are painting Russia into a corner where they feel so constricted and restricted that they feel like their only resource will be nuclear weapons in war. Not just war, but even implement it. Because in order to defeat a superpower like the United States, you can't just come with no rockets and regular tanks and stuff. So do you think that they're pushing him in a corner to uh, possibly go to war? And if he does that, do you think he would... How likely do you think he would be to use nuclear weapons. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I actually do. I do think that we are pushing uh, Putin and Russia into a corner. Um, and I'll tell you why I think that. I think that I, I think that part of this is influenced by the fact that I am in the United States. And the okay. only thing I can do, the only uh, institution that I have any, if any, <laughs> control over is really people in my own country, right. people in my own government. Yeah. And I say, yeah, if we want to resolve the situation, we should we should like lessen these sanctions and or at least talk about it right. by by opening negotiations right. and things like that. Um, and uh, I do think I mean I do think that the sanctions and also uh, the overproduction of oil right now and fracking in the United States mm. is driven down the price of oil on the international right. level, right. which weakens Russia because right. Russia has a decent supply of oil and Crude other oil. Yeah. natural mm-hmm. gas. Um, and so I think that Russia, but but we we are mistaken uh, in in a way. Yes, Russia is in a recession, but they are still, like you said, a very powerful nation. Yeah, it's I mean, very powerful. they are not the uh, Russia that they were when the Soviet Union collapsed. Right. They have turned around, as has uh, some places like China. Right. Um, and I think if we're not careful, if we're not careful, and this is strategically, let's pretend I'm in the White House and right. I'm talking to somebody, <clears throat> yes, and I'm not even trying to do the right thing right now. I'm just trying to do the strategic thing. Right. I think if we want to be strategic, we should be careful not forcing mm-hmm. Russia and China into a military alliance. Mm-hmm. Because ooh, that would be these, these are two superpowers <laughs> who they share a border and they don't get along very well. Right. But if we're not careful and we don't give either of them options, which um, we tend to be doing with Russia, That's right. 
and with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the economic agreement that we're making with countries surrounding China mm -hmm. to limit China's expansion, mm -hmm. this is kind of an, a, a soft but aggressive thing that we're doing to China that may send a message that says, look, you're either with us right. or, or you make your own decision to be independent. Mm -hmm. And that may mean saying, hey, you know, we got buddies in Russia that can actually we have a common enemy. And I don't think it, we want to do that. It's the I, enemy of my enemy. My friend, <laughs> friend or my enemy. Y'all right. jump. We got four let me, minutes. Let me just say briefly. When you talk about <laughs> economics and dealing with Russia, first of all, their economy is based on gold. Okay. Russia has gold. America, their economy is based on their military. The okay. issue of militarization and how they control themselves to go to your answer, uh, the question about are they pushing Russia into a corner? Yes. And black, it's all biblical prophecy, home. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> it is going to be a nations nuclear of nations war. Will fall. The, uh, the oh, bear, uh, uh, what's his name? Khrushchev said it, and the United Nations took his shoe off and said, We will destroy you, America. It's given to us by prophecy. We're going to let black close us out. All right, next week we're going to deal with the uh, ISIS and the 21 beheadings in Egypt. You mean ISIL? Wow. Yeah, ISIL. ISIL. You know the group that based their killings in, on a belief, get him, <laughs> on a belief system with no proof and evidence? Yes. So we're going to deal with that. So, with that being said, we out. Peace from the arena. Please, oh. peace. Please from the arena fight right. for it with the justice. Yes. Peace and justice. Peace and justice. Justice. Booty, do better. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. That's right. <laughs>